I want to focus in on, you know, the wedding is all about the coming of the Lord, okay? And I want to show you some things biblically. Last week, I was, or it was the week before last, I kind of got hung up. I was going to show you something in John about the triumphal entry and him cleansing the temple and um, how it was all geared around the time he's coming in it's uh, and what he's talking about it's really all about the marriage okay and it was Passover time and I went over with you guys before how every resurrection that ever happened in the Bible always happened in the springtime and so I wanted to show you some allusions to um, the wedding that really we can know the signs of the time I do believe with everything in me according to the scriptures that Jesus is going to return during the Passover feast time okay because that's really what it's all geared about and I'm going to show it to you and then um, let me just show you this real quick open your Bibles um, let's start in where am I start the cleansing of the temple let's look at that real quick and we're going to start in uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Matthew 21, 12. We know beyond the shadow of a doubt that this was at the end of Jesus' ministry, right? Now, he comes riding in, you know, on the 10th day of Nisan, you know, around, you know, April, May, in that time. Jesus rides in on the 10th day. This is four days before he dies, okay? So, and when he rides in, chapter 21 starts off the triumphal entry. And when he rides in, the first thing he does is, you know, just to lay it all out, they say, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they lay it down the palm fronds and all of that kind of stuff. And he comes in, and the first thing he comes in to do is to cleanse the house. Right. Right? Yeah. right. And because if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, you know, according to the Passover and what they had to do, they had to, you know, cleanse the house of all the leaven that was in it. Remember it? Right. Right. So he's fulfilling the scripture in the physical sense of riding into the house of God, his father's house, the temple. And what does he start doing? He starts, you know, you know, that's right. Breaks out a whip, over changes the money tables and all that. So he's actually getting all the leaven out the house, the physical house. He's cleansing house is what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So he's fulfilling that Passover and what he's supposed to do. So he, in Matthew chapter 21, at the end of his ministry, this is four days before he dies, Jesus Christ is cleansing the temple, right? So now let's look at, um, let, me, let me just read a little bit of it. It says in verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple, and, uh, and Jesus went to the temple of God and cast them all out that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And this is just basically Christ cleansing the house. All right. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 61. 26. 2661. I hope that's the right one. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 61, Jesus had already come in and cleansed the temple. Now, they got some false witnesses that come and approach him here. This is right before he dies, and it says, And they said, Uh, this fellow said that he would destroy the temple of God and build it again in three days. Okay? In Matthew chapter 26. So, Christ is cleansing the temple. When he goes in, they said, you know, what do you seek to do? Destroy this temple? He says, in three days, I'll raise it again. This is showing you that he is about to die right here. Okay? Now, I want to go to um, Mark chapter 14, verse 58. This is clearly at the end of his ministry. Mark chapter 14, 
Mark 14, verse 58. This is at the end of his life again. We see in verse 43, um, Judas betrays him. And then we go to 58, it says... Um, these witnesses say to him again, they say, this is Mark saying it, just repeating it. We heard him say that I'll destroy this temple uh, that was made with hands, and within three days he would build another uh, made without hands. So these are the witnesses that are just given witness to, you know, um, this is the end of his life. And I guess what I'm trying to lay out for you, and I am going to lay it out, is that what's going on is... Um, I want to show you the steps from the time that Christ rides in, what he does all the way to his death. This is at the end of his life. Now, something really struck me pretty odd. I tried to tell you guys this last week. Um, go to John chapter 2 now. Because at the end of Matthew, and at the end of Mark, and at the end of Luke, we see the triumphal entry. And we know at the triumphal entry is when Jesus cleansed the temple. Look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Christ cleanses the temple. That's the heading of it. It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temples those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out all of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So here in the second chapter, in the second chapter of John, you know, it's starting off with him cleansing a temple. This is at the end of his life. Yeah. Right? It's at the end of his life. But check this out. We know that, you know, what is happening right before it? Let's go up to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, we're just going to go up. And I believe that John, who wrote this, put it in this order for a reason. Because we're going to see that he cleanses the temple in John chapter 2. And then he gets into his life in John 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way to chapter 12. And chapter 12 is actually picking up where John chapter 2 left off. You got me? You understand? So watch this. So right before Christ cleanses the temple, and we know that Jesus said at Passover time, he says that in Matthew, I think it's in Matthew chapter 26, when he's having this Passover meal with him, right? He says, I will not drink from this cup again till I drink it with you anew in my kingdom. What cup, what cup is he talking about? It's this cup of the new covenant. It's the cup, it's the bride that he's talking. And it's all at Passover time. So here it is. If he's saying, I will not drink of this cup uh, uh, again with you. What cup? This Passover cup he's drinking. Until I drink it anew with you in my kingdom when he comes. So he's literally telling you he's coming in the spring feast. Yeah. You got me? Yeah. Right. Right. He's telling him when he's coming. And I'm going to show it to you. It's crazy. But he lays it out like that. And that's why in John chapter 2, when John talks about in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all this, he comes all the way, all the way down chapter 1, he immediately goes to a wedding in chapter 2. Right after the wedding in Canaan, he gives us the example of Jesus cleansing a temple. Wow! That's at Passover time. That's the time when he's coming. It's a time when Jesus is riding in on a colt. But next time it's going to be on a horse. But he's letting us know. John's like, man, why does God give us a wedding, a picture of a wedding in John chapter 2, right before the triumphal entry? Because he's letting us know when it's going to be. 
That's why this time is so important about us being geared up and being ready. Do you know the importance of that? You and I know that the time of the season that we should be looking for Jesus Christ. Where the world doesn't know that he's going to come around Passover time. So they won't be looking for him. That's why it's important to invite people to come to the wedding. Because so that we can tell them, hey, right now, more than any other time, you need to be looking for him. You need to be watching for him. Be ready. Be prepared. Is, is that referencing the fall the, the things in the temple? What? Is that referencing the falling away too that he spoke of before his return? The cleansing of the temple, it's going it, to... Because he said it would be a great fall in the way before he returns? I mean, this, well, he deals, with, he deals with the Pharisees first, and I'm going to get into it. But you're going to find in chapter 2 that he's dealing with a physical temple. But in chapter 12, he's dealing with a spiritual temple. See, the first temple he come to clean was the natural temple. And it picks up in John chapter 12 where he says that one of you that are sitting here are unclean. And it's a thief. Who was sitting in the, in, the, in the temple of God? It was thieves. Right? But yet, where he came in and cleansed the temple, the physical temple first, in John chapter 2, now he comes and cleanses the spiritual temple where he washes their feet. Right? Physical, spiritual. Now watch. So let's read John chapter 2. It says, you know, And on the third day, and the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, this is an illusion to let us know when his coming is going to be. John is letting us know. John the Revelator. Right? Who wrote the book of Revealing, Revelations, the Unveiling. Connect the dots. He says, And when they wanted wine, we know wine is the blood of the new covenant. The mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. What hour? His wedding. When is his wedding being proposed right here? At the triumphal entry. When is the triumphal entry? Passover. Wow. He's letting us know when he's coming. Do you realize if timing is off and we don't know the time, that we could be at a wedding Saturday and Jesus could come? Amen. Do you realize that? Amen. That's how important it is to invite people to come. Wow. Wow. Amen. That's serious stuff. Do you know when to look for him? Do you know when to be looking for Jesus? This is not no just no ordinary, oh, we're just going to do a little something to reach out. Man, this is about you can take off. I can take off. We can go. We're setting up a marriage. Can you imagine leaving at that time? Hallelujah. Oh, my God. We think if we go into a regular marriage, baby, we go to the marriage. Hallelujah. The marriage. Oh, my God, son. And think about all of those that you invited there. Can you imagine the people that gives their life to the Lord right there? All of a sudden, they're going to... Thank you, I'm telling you when Jesus is coming. I know the time and the season when He's coming. It's right there in His Word. Watch this. And Jesus said unto a woman, What have I to do with thee? There's a, and on the third day was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee. Jesus was invited. And all the disciples were invited. We're all invited. Woman, they're out of wine. What does this have to do with me? It's not my time yet for my wedding. But, he says, watch. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. And there were six water pots there of stone, after the manner of purifying the Jews. Right? Wow. Jesus is the purifier. Right? Contained in two or three firkins, about 20 gallons apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots to the brim. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw it out now and bear to the governor of the feast, the man in charge. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, that it was made into wine, he knew not whence it had come from, but the servants which drew the water knew. Wow! The servants know! Right. <laughs> 
The servants know. We know the six water pots represent six represents man. Twenty firkins, six times twenty is one twenty. After one hundred and twenty jubilees or six six thousand years, the wedding is going to happen. I showed this to you. And on the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan. I told you guys that. Why? Because 2,000 years after Jesus Christ, when the third day begins, on the third day is when his marriage takes place. And on the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan. When? In the springtime. Right at Passover time. Yeah. And then he goes in and he says, watch. When the rule of the feast said, when the rule of the feast had tasted the water that it was made to wine, he knew not whence it come, come, but the servants which drew the water knew it. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Wow. He called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then they that which is worse, wait, let me go back and read this. And he said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth the good wine. And when men have well drunk, when they have, you know, have drunken freely, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine unto now. Let me tell you something. Jesus, if this would have been in any other feast, if this would have been in the feast of, you know, in the fall feast, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the feast of Tabernacle, if it would have been in Hanukkah or any other, he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it. You know why? Because this was all about giving you and me a sign about when his wedding is going to be. Hallelujah. That's what he did. He operated in the feast. When they were speaking about light, that's what he spoke about. Right? When he spoke about Passover, he talked about how he was the Passover. When they talked about atonement in the day of atonement, in the fall feast, he talked about how he was that atonement. Jesus ministered within the feast. When they talked about the bread, the Passover, he said, I am the bread of life. He's stuck within the feast. So here it is. He's changing the water into wine during Passover season. Because that's when his marriage is. <laughs> Amazing. Watch this. It says, This, the beginning of miracles, did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee. And manifest forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. Man, he was saying, I am the blood of the new covenant. This wine represents, I am the bridegroom. This wine represents the marriage and when it's going to take place. Watch this. After this, he went down to Capernaum. And his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. <laughs> and the Jews' Passover was at hand. Right? Verse 13. Chapter 2, 13. And he went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money. Jesus only did this one time. Jesus only did this one time. He went in the temple on Passover and cleansed the house one time. And that's we know when he died. And here it is being manifested in John chapter 2, verse 13. Now, let's look at um, John chapter 12, verse 12. Go to John chapter 12. <laughs> this is crazy. But man, when you see it, let's start reading. Chap uh, John chapter 12. Mary anoints Christ. What, she, what is she anointing him for? For burial. Watch this. Watch how it even starts. Then Jesus, six days before Passover, came to Bethany. Right? Why six days? This is, his, uh, this is going into his triumphal entry. And verse 12 is the triumphal entry. Because after 6,000 years, he's going to come. Are you with me? Watch this. It says, Then Jesus, six days before Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which he had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. That means the resurrection is in the springtime. There it is again. They made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And took Mary and, and, and took 
Mary a pound of ointment and spikenard very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with the hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And we had did a big teaching on that. That was amazing. He is the ointment. He is the jar, you know, and, and all of that stuff. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pieces and given to the poor? Now remember, this is right before he dies. Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the bag, and he bore what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying, has she uh, kept this. For the poor always uh, ye have with you, but me you, not ha you have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Why? Because the resurrection is in the springtime. Right at Passover. Right? Let's go. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because by that reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. The next day, much people that were come to the feast... When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches and palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, he sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. Remember Jesus said, when he goes in and cleanses the temple, he said, I will no longer come unto you. Watch until you cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When is that? At his return. When is it? It's in the springtime. Oh, yeah. To the springtime, always on Passover. That's the, that's the time the resurrection of the dead came up out of the ground. That's the time they threw the man. Remember, the man, uh, they buried Elisha. The time the kings come out to battle and kings, it says that a man died and they threw him in a pit and he fell, hit Elijah's bones. It was in the springtime. Bam, he jumped up. Elisha means Yeshua, which means Jesus. The resurrection is in the springtime. Elisha healed the dead widow's boy. Elijah healed the dead widow's son, the one that got hit in the head. Remember, working with his dad out in the field. Amen. Remember, Elijah and Elisha both raised the dead. Naaman dipped seven times and got new skin, a new body, a new flesh in the springtime. In the springtime. You should be looking for Jesus now more than ever. Your wedding can happen this week coming. Do you realize that? Are you ready? Hallelujah. I'm ready to go. I'm ready. We could be throwing a wedding. Little do we know we're throwing a wedding. We're going to a wedding. And I'm going to talk about that. My wife, my wife, when the Lord told me to do a wedding for her, tell no, I mean, don't let her know what you're doing. Don't let her know. Man, we got a wedding dress for her. She thought she was going to a wedding. Little did she know she was going to her wedding. <laughs> wow. I'm going to talk about that at the thing. When we have that, you never know. Here she is, she's all dressed up in white, thinking she's going to my boss's wedding, and little does she know she's going to her own wedding. <laughs> Don't miss the opportunity to ask someone to come. Now more than ever. Jesus said, I'll not drink of this cup, but I'll drink it anew with you in my kingdom. You know, that's, you know, that, that's, that's the time we're in right now. <clears throat> he's letting you know when he's going to drink the cup anew in the springtime. He says um, in chapter 12, we get down to triumphal entry, and it says, um, let me go back, I lost my place. Oh, and... Um, Oh, the king cometh sitting on the asses of a colt. These things understood not his disciples at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. 
The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, they bear record. Man, now they're making the connection. Wow, we at this time should have been looking for him. We should have been looking for him and knowing it was him at this time. Um, let me go to, uh, in chapter 13, John chapter 13, we see in, uh, in John chapter 13, now, we caught it in John chapter 2, he was cleansing the physical temple, but in John chapter 13, at the Passover meal, right before, you know, um, here it is, Jesus Christ is cleansing the spiritual temple now. And he says, uh, Christ washes his disciples' feet. Now before the, the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, he loved his own which were in the world, and he loved them unto the end. A supper, and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. He rises from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself, and poured the water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and wiped them with a the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not. You don't know what I'm doing. But thou shalt know hereafter. You see, what Jesus was doing, he was about to die. And because of what he was about to do, he was giving him an outward, you know, manifestation. You know, I'm bent down right now. And I'm about to wash your feet. And you don't know what this is right now. But your feet represent the path and what you do and where you go. He said, but what I'm about to go do on the cross, and I die and, and rise again, it's going to wash you spiritually. But I'm going to show you what I'm about to do. And he says, um, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And listen, Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all of you. And you know, this is where he addresses, you know, uh, Judas Iscariot. One of, the, one of the pictures I had blown up, because this is really, in all honesty, what it's all about. And you guys know it. That's what it's about. Right there. This doesn't have anything to do with, you know, this right here. It has everything to do with this. This is what we've been called to do. This is how we are clean. This is what it's about. This is what we need to be doing when the people come to the marriage over there. This is what you're going to be doing. Washing their feet. I'm not talking about physically. Because physically washing their feet ain't going to do anything. But spiritually washing their feet is going to do everything. Amen. You understand? This is what it's about. This will be uh, one of the pictures. When we go in and have, uh, and we do it, you know, we have the marriage set up. You know, the whole tabernacle is going to be set up. So when they walk up to this, when they walk, come to the, you know, the Salem house, come, you know, Saturday evening, outside is going to be the altar and the laver. And inside, when they open the doors, the lampstand, the showbread table, the altar of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant is going to be set up when you walk into the entrance. On the other side of the wall is where all the tables are. And little do they know that they're going to be walking through the procession of salvation when they come in through the door and they don't even know what they're doing. So that when you know, we begin to minister to them, after feeding them. While we're feeding them. Because that's what Jesus did. Okay. First thing he did was feed them. And then he fed them spiritually. 
Because once you feed them, you get them quieted down and, you know, what's going on? I mean, they got like, what? They're going to be like, what the heck's going on? Little do they know that Jesus is going to be reaching out to them, inviting them to his wedding, inviting them to be his bride. And either they could say, I do, or I don't. They can reject it and walk away, but that's totally up to them. It's up to us, you and me, our job. I don't care if you think they're going to come or they ain't going to come or are not going to come. Invite them. Amen. Invite them. At least you could say, Lord, I asked them to come. I don't care if they got something else to do. It don't matter. If something comes up where something happens, whatever you're doing, hey, don't forget this wedding. You don't want to miss it. Man, that's what's more important than anything. And we're praying that God will bring those He wants. Amen. Christian and non-Christian. Saved and unsaved. I don't care who they are. Right? Because that's what it's about. We, our job, have, our job is to invite. Invite. Amen. And we'll let God handle the rest. I want to show you, um, between, between the 10th and the 14th, this is what went down. Between the 10th day of Nisan, Christ riding in, and the 14th day of Nisan. I want to let you know another thing. This was the closing out of an age. You realize that? This was the closing out of an age. You know, we, it says that when Jesus came, He split time, right? When He was born. And that's how they take it. But the real closing out of the age is when He died and rose again. Because the old covenant passed away, and a new covenant was established when He arose from the dead. That's when a new, an old age had vanished, and now a new age began. Right? The new covenant. The blood covenant. So between the 10th and the 14th, this is what went down. On the 10th day, Jesus rides in, the triumphal entry. Right? He rides in. First thing He does, now, and the reason I'm telling you this is because we can kind of see through this what's going to come, what's going to happen. What he did then, he's going to do again. So, let's see. Jesus is coming, right? And the first thing he does is cleanses the temple, right? Amen. So he's going to cleanse the house of God. Amen. The Bible says judgment begins at the house of God, Amen. right? He rode straight into the Pharisees and Sadducees. Right to them. You have made my father's house into a den of thieves. That's the society and the age in which we live today. Amen. The church, the so-called church, or the buildings of God are robbing God. Right. Who are they robbing? Well, we're going to read it in Malachi chapter 3. <coughs> Who are they robbing in Malachi chapter 3? Yeah. Right? They're robbing God of His tithes, the Bible says, right? I'm not here to talk about tithes. Amen. What was the importance of the tithe then? Come on, brother. It was to feed the widows. <laughs> to feed those that were, you know, the orphans. Well, that's what's happening today. They build big buildings. They got financial, you know, got to fly around in $60 million planes while the children are starving. Would you like to give account for that? You got to sit in a $60 million luxurious plane while people are starving to death. How does that fit? It's pretty simple. You robbed God. Therefore, He can't take care of His people. And it's been given to you and me to do. So here, Jesus Christ, He's going to cleanse the temple. When he comes in, he finds the fig tree is barren. These religious people okay. that you're seeing on TV are barren. They have no fruit. They have no fruit. And they're cursed. Twice dead, plucked up by the root. Amen. That means they, you know, receive Christ. 
and then got drifted off into other things, right? So here you got the cleansing of the temple. Jesus says, you know, they're all barren. Then the so-called religious people want to question his authority. Remember that? Well, by what right do you come in here, you know, to do these things? Overchange the money tables. Do you wish to, you know, tear the temple down and, you know, destroy this wonderful temple that took 46 years in building? And then he says, destroy this temple, I'll raise it again in three days. Physical, spiritual. He's connecting. The physical house that they built took 46 years. The spiritual house you're made up is 46 chromosomes, 23 and 23, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, okay, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. John the Baptist, was he sent from God or from man? And what did it say? First thing. Well, if he was sent by God, well then, you know, he's going to ask us why we didn't listen to him. But, you know, if we sent by people, you know, they were worried about what the people would think. They were worried about what the, they were worried about the people losing them. Because they were the ones being worshipped. You know, they walked around in the robes. Oh, there's brother so-and-so. He's so holy. Yeah, he's holy. All right. He's leaking all over the place. He's full of holes. But he's the wrong holy. <laughs> then, the next thing you have, um, when they can't answer him, he says, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority that I do this. Right? Because they missed it. Because John, that came preparing the way, we find in Isaiah, the Bible says, John was the Elijah to come, to cleanse the way, but they didn't listen to him. Right? The Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, who are you? Are, the, are you the Christ? Are you Jeremiah? Are you Isaiah? Are you Ezekiel? You no, know who? I'm not nothing, he says. And that's real, that's who we are. We're nothing. He didn't proclaim to be anything, but they missed it. He was a sign. He was the Elijah to come. Turning the hearts back to the people. Turning the hearts of the people back to God. I'm sorry. The next thing we see, the parable of the two sons. He gives this parable and he says, hey, one son said he was going to do it and didn't do it, but the other son was grudgingly and angry. I ain't doing it, but he went and did it. Who did the will? Right? How many of us do that, man? Uh, I don't want to go do that. But you did it. Right? So then, the next thing he gives is a, a parable out of the marriage. So here it is, he's hitting the marriage. Right? Not only does it do the parable with the marriage, but then he hits the parable with the vineyard. Uh, the vineyard is about when the owner of the vineyard comes. The parable at the marriage is the same thing. The time of the marriage. It's all between the 10th and the 14th. He's talking about a vineyard, about his coming. He's talking about a marriage. He's talking about his coming. It's the triumphal entry. That's about his coming. And then it talks about, hey, one will do the will and one won't. Right? Sure. Amen. So it's all geared toward his coming. How you can not? You can just uh, red skies at night, sail is the light, right? You can discern the signs of the times or, or the signs that's, you know, by the sun. And all. How can you not discern the signs of the times? If he came then, he's going to come again the same time. Right. He's not here to trick us. No. The great hidden day has been revealed to you and me. Then he, um, you know, they want to... Uh, Catch him in some stuff, you know, about Caesar, you know, about the money and stuff like that. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God's what is God's. What was God's? The tithe was God's then. Because the temple was still standing. The new covenant had not been established yet. Right? And then, Jesus, what does the Pharisees and Sadducees question Jesus about? <laughs> they want to catch him. So what do they want to catch him in? A marriage. They're going to talk about a marriage, right? Okay, you know, Jesus, you know, a man has a woman who's married to her and he dies and she has no kids. And then the, 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 uh, the other brother has her and then seven. You know, where, you know, who's going to have her in heaven? It's all about a marriage. Yeah. You think these questions, everything is falling out like it is? No. It's happening divinely and purposely. It's all set up so that you and me will know. Right? And then 
he begins, he puts out eight woes on them, you know, because all the religious people rejected Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? The religious people today and the big buildings and the cathedrals and all that that they set up, they fear man more than they fear God. And it's all about money. So guess what? That's the ones that God lays the woes on, right? The Pharisees and Sadducees. Then Jesus laments over Jerusalem. How often he had pulled them in and gathered them in like chicks, like hens, uh, little chicks under a mother's uh, wing. wing. And then the next thing he says, and the next thing he says is, he gives us the signs to look for for his coming. <laughs> Matthew chapter 24, 25, 26, and 27, that's all he's talking about. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. As the days of Noah were, the fig tree, the parable of the ten virgins. Okay. As lightning comes from the east to the west. My God, son, how much more plain and simple can it get? If this is not the time that he's coming, something is wrong. Because all he's talking about is marriage and coming. Marriage and coming. And here I come and be ready and be looking and be watching and be waiting. <laughs> then he gives us the fig tree. When is the fig tree bloom? Why tender? Go outside and look. Right now. Right now. Mm. Yeah. Oh. And the next thing he says, be ready for his coming. The parable of the ten virgins. Then he warns about his coming with the parable of the talents. He gave one five, one three, one one. So when the master what? Comes back. When he comes back, he's going to ask that servant, what did you do with the talents that I gave you? What is that about? That's about his coming. That's right. Mm -hmm. Again. Mm -hmm. So from the time he rides in on the 10th day of Nisan to his death, all he talks about is his coming. In Matthew chapter 24, 25, 26, that's all about his future coming. <laughs> it's all about the future coming. So man, he has geared it down for you and me to know the season he's coming. And this is the season we're in right now. Oh, let me see. I think that's it. I'm gonna stop. Let me let me look. I'm gonna read Malachi three. Malachi, Malachi, the last book of the old covenant. Jesus directly quotes it. It's uh, reference to it. Malachi chapter three. That's in verse 10. But the purpose of it, this is the whole deal. Listen to the heart of the Lord here. Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. That's the triumphal entry. That's the triumphal entry. Right? Even the messenger of the covenant. He's the one. I make all things new. I change the water to wine. I give you a new covenant. Right? Whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? That's the second coming. First one is the first coming. Verse 2 is the second coming. That's right. That's revelations. Who's going to be able to stand when he comes? So, so Malachi is hitting his first coming and his second coming in the first two verses. Watch. But who may be able to sp uh, uh, abide to be able to, but who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's uh, sop. That's what he was doing, those Pharisees and Sadducees. In fact, check this out. This could be just his first coming, okay? Because it says right here, Who will be able to stand when he comes? Whom seek ye? And John, Jesus, I am he. And what did they do? Whoom! They all hit the ground. That fulfilled verse 2. <laughs> you heard me? When they came seeking Jesus and John, Whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth, I am He. Oh, yeah. Who may be able to abide and stand? 
None. They all hit the ground. Right? Yep. It says in verse 3, And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. That's where he went. He went to the temple. The Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyers. <coughs> he went to refine them. And they dared not ask him any more questions. Because <laughs> son, he even put it on them. <coughs> It says that when you read in, in Matthew and John, when the Sadducees, when they seen that uh, Jesus put a silence to the Sadducees, the Pharisees come up and question him. And he put them down too. And then the lawyers try to get him. And it says, and they dared ask him not any more questions. <laughs> now listen to this. It says, and he shall sit as a refiner of silver and purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. You see, because what they were doing, they were robbing God of everything in the temple when He had come. They were selling, they was robbing the widows, they was giving them all the worst, the junk, built, you know, beautiful temples, they dressed in a raid and, and all of this stuff, but man, just not taking care of God's people. Right? <laughs> Then shall the offering of then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant. What was the offering of Judah? Jesus. Mm -hmm. He came and made the offering. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God. Right? And it says um then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in their wages, the widow and the fatherless. And that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. He said, I'm bringing judgment on you because you're not taking care of them. And I've set this institution up for you to take care of the widow, the orphan, these people, and, and all of this. So what does he do? Malachi is putting it on him. And he says, For I am the Lord, and I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers you have gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return unto you? Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have I robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Because this is what was used to take care of those that had nothing. Poor, widow, maimed, orphan. Right. So in the house of God was no meat. In the house of God today, there's no meat. Why? Because they got to pay bills and pay big things and they can't feed the people. All they can do is feed the electric company and feed the planes and feed the buildings and feed the people that's working and feed them in their suits and their tires and nobody's getting fed physically or spiritually. Amen. Right. That's how they're robbing God. That's how they're robbing Him. Oh, big money, let's build a big building. Listen, did Jesus build one building? No, he did not. No, he did not. That's right, and he was a carpenter. Wow. Where's the church of God? Ecclesia, it's outside the walls. It ain't in here. It's not this building, should I mean. That's why whatever we can do, whatever talents that God has placed in our hands, you are now the tabernacle, the temple of God. If you could bless someone, bless them. If you can't, well then you can't. Right? We're the hands. We're the extension. You can bless people right now. Tell them to come to a wedding feast. And hey, man, you need to come to this. What it's about, just come. Man, eat all you want. Pig out. It's a feast. 
Let God get them, man. Yes. Man, I can't tell you enough. Don't miss the opportunity to tell someone to come, to invite someone. To invite them. Hey, I know you got something planned, but I'm still inviting you. You are invited. And if they come, they come. And if they don't, it's okay. But we're praying and we're believing Amen. that the Lord of the harvest is going to send the harvest. But what He does first is He sends the laborers in the field. I'm telling you, it could be this Saturday that Jesus comes. It could be we're entering into that time right now. We're entering that time right now. And if you're not ready, man, get ready. Amen. And you got to be excited about that. If people don't see it on you, Amen. if people don't see it on you, they ain't coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what kind of wedding you going to? I like what Doug said, man. Oh, is it your wedding? Yeah. Look, man, just come. Yeah. We're all having a wedding. We're just throwing a big feast, a celebration. Jesus is inviting you to his wedding. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we can't do it without you, Father. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your word that lets us know that we're in the times and the season of your return. And Lord, we're looking for you, Father. Lord, we're asking that your spirit would move over this because it's all about you, Father. And according to your word, when we, when, if, if we lift up the sun, you will draw all people unto yourself. So, Lord, we're doing this to honor the King of Kings. And, 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 and the God of gods, Yahweh, the one true God, Yeshua. So Holy Spirit, we speak and ask you that you would go forth and help us to bring people across our path to invite them to come. And Holy Spirit, we're asking that you begin to move on them. You know the ones. Well, we're asking for a return just so that we can offer it back to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we don't want to go empty-handed before the King. Amen. We don't want to go empty-handed before the King. We want to have others that are behind us, with us. Help us, Father. Give us a passion and a desire for You. Lord, help me to prepare the words, Father, and and help us to, to set up things that, you know, it's just, just make it, help us make it right for you. Give me the words to speak to the people while they're there, Lord. This one opportunity to be able to catch some fish for you, Father. Lord, help us to throw the net on the right side of the boat. We're listening to you, Lord. Lord, we pray that not only that, that salvation would come, Father, but Lord, that... Lord, those that would, had fallen asleep, well, Lord, would just wake up again. Yes. Just be, Lord, we ask for people to be ignited for you, Lord, to blow on that smoke and flax. Those that have been hurt, Lord, to heal the bruised reeds, Lord. Help us, Lord. Lord, times are getting crazy, Father. And we need more of you, Father. We know that you said in the end there's going to be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we're looking for it. Don't let us miss it, Father. We don't want to miss it, Lord. We want everything that you have for us. Help me, Lord. Help us, Father. I can't do it without you, Lord. I thank you, Father. For Lord, this... Uh, I thank you for the fellowship, Lord. I thank you for the brethren that are here. Lord, I thank you for, uh, the, man, the ones that are gathered here. Lord, they love you, Father. I thank you and I thank them just for what they do. Lord, they have the, the, the provision that they make, the, the giving, Father. They give, Lord. Father, the people in this church, they give what they have, that's for sure. And Father, I thank you for it, Lord. Thank you. We might not have over and abundant, but we have enough. Yeah. And we trust in you, Father. I pray over the food. Lord, that it'll just uh, it'll bring nourishment to them, yes. physically and spiritually, Lord, that they're going to receive, Father. Yes. Let them be excited, Father. Bring the fire, Lord. Yes. Bring the, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of yes. God. Yes. Draw them to you, Lord. Lord, we're asking for people uh, to just uh, 
go away thinking of You and just changed and amazed by Your love, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen.